Okay, um, I thank the organizers for having me here. Uh, um, and uh, uh, my name is Rishi, as he said, and I'm in the Indian Institute of Science. That's my website and that's my email address. If you have any questions, uh, uh, you could just uh, uh, write me an email, basically. So I'll start with the acknowledgement slides. Uh, um, um, most of the work that I'm going to talk about today is uh, by Rahul. Uh, both the, uh, the computational and the experimental work was done by him. Uh, um, and I'll also briefly touch upon work by Arun and Chinmay, but uh, that's going to be very brief. Uh, and I also thank all the lab members that uh, contributed to much of the work that went in the lab, that goes on in the lab. Uh, and these are the funding organ organizations, and this is the reason the lab is uh, running. I should thank them for uh, having us uh, running, basically. Okay. So um, the, the title of the, the talk says Degeneracy in uh, Hippocampal Physiology and Plasticity. So I should first talk about what uh, degeneracy is. I should introduce you to the term, uh, consider it as uh, the word of the day, if you will. Uh, so degeneracy is defined as the ability of uh, elements that are structurally different uh, to perform the same function or yield the same output. Right? So, so this was first introduced in this landmark paper, uh, landmark review by um, Edelman and Ghali. And they wrote this paper, Degeneracy in Complexity in Biological System. And this is something that I subscribe as mandatory reading for my core students as well as people in my um, laboratory. So I would strongly suggest that you read through this. Uh, so this is the definition basically. It's not redundancy. So there is a significant amount of difference between degeneracy and redundancy. So redundancy is about uh, the same function being performed by identical elements. If one fails, uh, the other takes over. So that's the, the, ident the, the definition of redundancy. On the other hand, uh, degeneracy involves structurally different elements. There are two different sets of things. Uh, so one, comp one set of things uh, and another set of completely different structural elements uh, which would come together to perform exactly the same function where functionally you would not see a difference. Uh, but if you go and look at the structures that yield that function, that's going to be very different. Right? So, and this paper um, uh, goes on to look at uh, degeneracy at different levels of biological organization. So as you know, uh, several biological systems uh, could be analyzed in different scales. Uh, there's nothing different with reference to neuroscience as well. Uh, you could ask questions about neuroscientific, uh, 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 you could ask neuroscientific questions at the genetic level or at the molecular level, cellular level and so on and so forth until the behavioral level, right? So, so here in this paper, in this table that is, uh, that I have copy pasted from there, you see that at this end of it, you see the genetic code and at the other end of it, you see inter-animal communication, right? So, so you have uh, the paper reviews uh, the expression of degeneracy across these different scales of analysis uh, within different biological systems uh, and talks about how in each of these different scales uh, you have mechanisms by which dipping structural components could come together to elicit exactly the same function. For today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on uh, the cellular and the molecular aspects of it. That's what my lab focuses on. Uh, so we are largely cellular neuroscientists uh, and we also ta um, um, uh, under try to understand the contribution of different channels uh, to cellular function. So this is the uh, area that we are expertise in. And we are a combined uh, uh, experimental and uh, uh, computational laboratory. The experiment being the electrophysiological experiments and uh, the computation being uh, computation. Right? So, so in today's uh, uh, seminar, uh, uh, I'll talk about a story where we started out from experimental measurements, uh, feed that experimental data into computational models, uh, come up with a specific prediction and go back to experimental bench and test that prediction. So that's the kind of story that I'm going to be telling about. Uh, and as I said, most of this work or all this work that I'm going to talk for the first part of it uh, is by Rahul, who, is a P who was a PhD student uh, who recently graduated. Uh, so the, the, the second term in the, in the title is the hippocampus. Uh, so that's a brain region a mammalian brain region that is uh, uh, that has been implicated in spatial learning and memory. Right? So, so this is uh, uh, let's say that this is an arena, and there is a rodent there, uh, and you have this different spatial cues. Uh, so there is a green box, and there is a, um, uh, a red box, and a green ellipse that is present over here. And as the animal traverses through this arena, if you are recording from one single hippocampal neuron, which are called as place cells, uh, you would see that uh, that neuron fires. Uh, maximally at one specific location and not others. Right? As the animal enters into this particular place field of this neuron, uh, you would see that the, um, the neuron fires maximally 
otherwise uh, it's going to be not fired. Right? So, so that's one of the kind of things that uh, uh, hippocampus contains. It has a spatial map uh, of the, the external environment. Uh, and you also see that uh, um, there are tasks, there are learning tasks that the animal can perform. So this is what is called as the Morris water mesa, and you have different uh, visual cues around this tank of water. And there is a hidden platform the animal cannot see. Uh, it is uh, submerged under the water. And on the first day, the first trial, you place the animal somewhere within the arena, and it roams around for a while, and serendipitously discovers that there is a hidden platform over here. And as days progress uh, over several different trials, in this case 10, you observe that when, the, when, when you place the animal at any location after the 10 trials, uh, you see that irrespective of where it is placed, uh, see that the animal is able to discover this uh, location based upon these visual cues. Right? So, so this is a spatial learning task because it is uh, asking, it's learning the position of this hidden platform uh, with reference to this uh, spatial cues, uh, and therefore it's a spatial learning task. Uh, on the other hand, if you lesion the hippocampus, if you remove the hippocampus from these uh, animals, you would see that uh, even after these 10 different trials, uh, the animal is still unable to uh, learn the spatial task and it is still roaming around the entire world uh, uh, before finding out this uh, location over here. And so so that's, that's one of the uh, reasons why the hippocampus is, uh, has been implicated in uh, spatial learning and memory. But one is the presence of a spatial map. Uh, and other is that if you lesion the hippocampus, it cannot perform uh, uh, spatial tasks, uh, spatial learning tasks uh, effectively. And if you look at the circuitry of, uh, of the hippocampus, you would see that uh, it is a very nicely organized structure. Uh, so that's the, um, the rat brain. Uh, so that's the olfactory bulb. Uh, that's the cerebellum. And this structure over here is the cortex. Uh, and the banana-shaped structure, which occupies a significant portion of the rodent brain. There are two of them, one left and another right. Uh, so that is what is called as the hippocampus. Right? So, so this is the dorsal end of it, uh, and that's the ventral end of it, and you have this uh, banana-shaped structure forming the hippocampus. Uh, if you take a slice of this particular hippocampal structure at any point along this septotemporal axis, uh, you would see this um, nice structure where you have uh, different subfields, uh, and these are on neuronal cell bodies. If you zoom in on this location over here, uh, you would see something like this, where there are a bunch of cell bodies that are nicely organized within the structure, and all these dendritic structures uh, are perpendicular to the axonal fibers that are coming uh, from the CA3 towards this particular structure. So this is the CA1 region of the hippocampus, uh, and you have these nicely organized uh, uh, neuronal structures that are present over here. The topic of investigation in our laboratory is with reference to the CA1 pyramidal cells, uh, and because of the nice organization, you can actually perform uh, um, uh, um, um, dendritic recordings, dendritic patch clamp recordings uh, from these ten thin dendrites, which are on the order of uh, two, three microns, the, the thicker ones, uh, and you could make conclusions about how exactly the information processing is happening uh, within this dendritic structure. Right? So, so if you um, zoom in again, if you further ask what kind of circuitry is present over here, uh, you would see that this is the kind of circuitry. This is the CA1, this is the CA3 that I was talking about. Uh, so these are the neurons that we are interested in. Uh, and if you ask what kind of connections come onto the circuit, so this is the cell body which is here, and these are the dendrites which are shown over here. So this is the typical structure of a CA1 pyramidal neuron, and this is a typical structure of a CA3 pyramidal neuron. Uh, you see that uh, different parts of this neuron gets inputs from different sub brain regions, right? So the Schaffer collaterals, for instance, uh, get exclusive inputs from uh, CA3 um, and even the, 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 uh, the stratum orients and then the stratum radiatum, both of them get inputs from the, the Schaffer collaterals. Uh, and the temporomonic pathway is the one that comes from um, the entorhinal cortex. Uh, and that impinges on the distal dendrites of uh, the CA1 pyramidal neurons. Right? So, so the circuitry is nicely laid out, and there is segregated inputs that are coming onto the structure. And therefore, if you are placing a synaptic electrode and stimulating it, uh, you are sure that uh, you are activating one bunch of synapses and not another. Right? So it wouldn't have been possible if there were interleaving inputs coming from the CA3 and the entorhinal cortex uh, impinging all over the place. Uh, but because of this nice segregation, it has been much easier to study um, uh, plasticity and other things from that perspective. It has been a very nice circuitry, the hippocampuses, right? So if you zoom in on this neuron further, uh, so you have this neuron over here. Uh, let's say that uh, this is cell body and that's the trunk. Uh, and I have a cartoonist, uh, cartoon, cartoon representation of this uh, hippocampal pyramidal neuron. Now that's the cell body 
and those are the dendrites. Uh, so I'm going to um, now say that there are several functional maps which express uh, on this hippocampal uh, neuronal topograph. Uh, so when I say map, I'll have to define what it is, right? So, so let's say that you have the real world uh, and you have a Google map reference of the real world, right? So there is a location A in the real world uh, and there is a corresponding location that you place uh, within your uh, Google map structure uh, and there is a location B in the real world uh, which also has a corresponding location in uh, the Google map. If the, um, in the in the real world, location E and location B are adjacent to each other, then you would want that uh, the in the Google map also, location A and location B should be adjacent to each other. If there is a topographic continuity between different locations in the real world, uh, you would want that to map on to the Google map as well. Right? So, so you have two different domains now. One is the real world and the other is this representational structure that you are trying to um, use for understanding what is out there. Uh, and if there is topographic continuity in the in one of these domains, uh, there is topographic continuity here as well, and therefore you are calling it as a map, right? Uh, so here, let's say that uh, you have these uh, um, different uh, uh, locations along this neuron, right? So, so you have this cell body, you have this 100 micron dendrite, 150 micron dendrite, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is the spatial topography, different uh, locations adjacent to each other, uh, and this is the measurement topograph. Let's say that it is the selectivity, um, the frequency selectivity of the structure over here. Right? So how many of you have heard about this auditory neuronal maps, uh, maps in the where there are neurons which are present in the auditory system, and if you uh, have uh, adjacent neurons, if you look at adjacent neurons, they would be selective to adjacent frequencies. Uh, you have not heard about it. That's okay. Fine, no problem. Right, so let's say that uh, there is a measurement topograph where these neuronal compartments uh, are not like uh, they are selective to every possible frequency. They have a specific frequency selectivity associated with them. Right, so, and let's say that this one uh, over here, which I have shown in grayscale, uh, this is black and this is white, uh, and the, the uh, intermediate levels of gray are there. Uh, and this is one, so one particular frequency, let's say this is around 4 hertz or something like that, and this is around 12 hertz. Uh, um, and if you look at the selectivity of uh, uh, these compartments, you would see that uh, they continuously span between 4 to 12 hertz. Uh, so one topograph is the spatial topograph, uh, and the other one is the measurement topograph. In this case, we have considered the example of frequency selectivity. And as you go, um, as um, just as this is adjacent to each other, there is a spatial continuity associated with this. Uh, there is a corresponding continuity associated with this uh, frequency selectivity as well. And therefore, we call it as a frequency um, map in this topograph. Uh, so how do you measure this? Uh, so you have this, uh, you, you present different frequencies to this uh, neuronal structure uh, and ask which frequency does it maximally respond to, right? So you are presenting uh, uh, sinusoids of different frequency to the cell body, to the 100 micron dendrite and so on and so forth. Uh, so you would get a typical curve like this. This is measured from the cell body over here. Uh, and you see that uh, uh, this particular neuron, the cell body is responsive maximally to 6.4 hertz. Right? So, so you keep doing this for different uh, uh, sinusoids and you would find that for one particular sinusoid it will have the maximal response. Uh, on the average, uh, you see that uh, the cell body which is represented over here uh, has a lower frequency selectivity compared to the distal dendrite. <coughs> right? And there is a continuous map. Uh, so this is the spatial topograph over here and this is the frequency space and you see that adjacent locations uh, are responding to adjacent frequency along the frequency axis and therefore you call it as a map uh, between the spatial topograph and the frequency uh, space that is present on the other side. Similar to this, uh, you have several other things uh, that are uh, uh, expressing on the same topograph. This is phase. Uh, without going into details, uh, just look at this is the phase response. Uh, so you present a sinusoid uh, and you are looking at uh, um, so this is the current, let's say. So there is a sinusoidal current that you are injecting into the cell. Uh, and you could have the, this is current, let's say, and the voltage response to this current, uh, the steady state voltage response uh, could either lead or could either lag. So this is the, the voltage response, the white is the current. Uh, could either lag the current uh, input or you could have a lead with reference to this. Uh, so that's also another possibility, right? Uh, and it turns out, uh, if you look at uh, this curve over here, uh, you see that this uh, is 
frequency on the x-axis and this is the amount of either lead if it is positive it's going to be lead and if it is negative it's going to be lag right so at certain frequencies you observe that uh, there is a lead in the voltage response uh, uh, with reference to the current input uh, and at certain other frequencies uh, you see that uh, it is going to be a lag, uh, a negative phase implies that there is a lag over there. Right? And this phase response uh, is something which is dependent upon the location of uh, the, the dendritic location. At the cell body, you see that the amount of lead is pretty low. And as you move into the dendrites, you see that that area and the positive area under this curve is going to increase with distance. Uh, and that is what is plotted over here. This area under this curve, the positive area over here is what is plotted over here. And that also you see is increasing with the distance from the cell body. So there are several such functional maps that are expressed on, uh, on the hippocampal uh, uh, somatoapical topograph. Uh, so one of them is input resistance, which decreases with distance. Uh, the resonance frequency that I showed you just now increases with distance. Uh, uh, there is one more resonance frequency mediated by another type of ion channel that decreases with distance. Uh, and there are also other measurements like the back propagating action potential, which reduces with the distance and so on and so forth. Right? So, so there are several functional maps uh, that are expressing on the same neuronal topograph, uh, which maintain this continuity in terms of uh, measurement space uh, with reference to the same um, spatial topograph that we are talking about. Right? So, so that's, the, um, that's, how, that, that's what is present uh, within a neuron. Uh, uh, so what mediates this? Uh, so if you look at the, the, the reasons why uh, these maps exist, uh, you, would, uh, uh, sh you would see that they are because of the presence of specific ion channel gradients. Uh, so you see that, for instance, uh, the H current uh, is the one that mediates this H resonance frequency, which increased with distance from the cell body. And you see that the, the corresponding channel density within the hippocampal pyramidal neuron also increases with distance. Right? So, so this increase in, uh, in uh, uh, the, the HCN channel density is what is partially mediating uh, this increase in resonance frequency with distance. Right? So, so this is something which is uh, actively maintained by the neuron. This is not something which is passively expressed. Uh, the neuron has to express uh, specific ion channels at specific locations uh, for you to be able to get uh, a lower frequency at the cell body and a higher frequency selectivity at the distal end of it. Right? So, so you have to have the specific uh, gradients. Uh, and it's also clear that uh, not all neurons within the brain are made the same. Uh, so you see that certain neurons have uh, an increasing gradient, certain other neurons like this mitral cells or the CA3 pyramidal neurons. Uh, you see that there is no gradient of uh, uh, this particular channel over here. So there is significant variability in terms of the specific gradients expressed by different neurons. Uh, so this is one of the channels. This is another channel which mediates the backpropagating action potential. Excuse me, action potential map over here. And here also you observe a significant amount of variability. Uh, and uh, no two. I mean, not th th there are not. Uh, uh, e each and every neuron has its own signature gradients uh, in terms of. Uh, how exactly the HCN channel gradient would look like, how exactly the A-type potassium channel gradient would look like, and so on and so forth, right? So, so and uh, um, we know this, uh, we know that this mediates the resonance frequency map and this mediates the backpropagating action potential map because uh, if you block these channels acutely, then you would abolish the expression of those specific maps over there. So if you actually look at the experimental data, this is something which I collected when I was a postdoc. Uh, um, and how do you collect this? You actually record from the cell body and from different locations along the dendrite. Uh, and you would measure uh, the backpropagating action potential amplitude, input resistance, resonance frequency, and so on and so forth. Uh, you would measure all of this at different locations and put this over here to arrive at these uh, stylized uh, representations where you see that there is an increased, increased uh, resonance frequency by binning these together and uh, uh, plotting them as a, uh, connecting them with a, a curve over there. But real biological data is not uh, something which is either a linear, uh, linearly reducing one or an exponentially uh, rising one. So you see that overall this looks like a linear curve, but there is significant variability in terms of what the backpropagating action potential amplitude is uh, at any specific location, depending upon which neuron you are recording from, right? So biological data is, significant amount of variability. Even within the same neuronal subtype, uh, you see that there is significant amount of variability in uh, the specific measurements that you get from there. Right? So, so these are the six uh, functional maps uh, 
the back propagating action potential input resistance resonance frequency and so on and so forth uh, which uh, uh, are um, present on the same sets of neurons uh, that we record that i recorded at that point of time right so so you observe that these are um, present uh, on the same neuronal topograph uh, uh, with set of channels that are expressed within this uh, structure over there so the question that uh, um, i'm sorry before that uh, so if you also look at the the channels that are responsible for uh, mediating these uh, functional maps uh, there also you observe a significant amount of variability even though there is a straight line over here that is something which was obtained by uh, connecting the means uh, and uh, uh, if you actually look at the data that you get for different locations along the dendrite uh, you would see that there is significant amount of variability in terms of the the density of the channels uh, so this is the density of a type potassium channel this is the density of hcn channels uh, and if you look at the activation inactivation profiles of this uh, a type potassium channel and the activation curve of this uh, you observe that there is significant amount of variability over there right so so despite the presence of this significant amount of variability in the underlying ion channels uh, so the neuron is able to express uh, these functional maps uh, on the same topograph right so so the questions that rahul asked uh, where uh, how do these functional maps uh, maintain homeostasis in the face of variability in underlying ion channel gradients uh, is it required that individual ion channels are maintained at specific densities uh, to achieve robust co-expression of all these functional maps uh, on the same neuronal topograph so the important point is that uh, you have this structural constraint right uh, on the same structure you will have to have all the functional maps expressed basically right so and uh, the it, it's not like uh, what one ion channel regulates each of these things uh, the input resistance for instance is affected by the hcn channels the um, the a type potassium channels the leak channels and so on and so forth uh, so each of these measurements have distinct uh, uh, dependencies uh, and therefore how is it that it is able to maintain this despite the significant variability and what channel localization and targeting strategy should a neuron follow towards maintenance of these functional maps right so so the the, the last question is not something which is simple uh, because uh, if you look at um, uh, hippocampal so this is the hippocampal structure again uh, so this is the cell body um, and these are the dendrites over here uh, if you look at the hcn channel density you see that there is a higher expression of uh, that channel over here uh, and the a type potassium channel you see that there is a higher expression of uh, that particular channel right so so there are specific expression profiles uh, for each of these channels uh, within the neurons and the neuron has to spend too much energy in maintaining those gradients sending those uh, channels towards dendritic and maintaining that gradient uh, so that's not something which is uh, an easy task so this review would uh, tell you more about it uh, so in pyramidal limb because of the extensive dendritic carbonization and the combinatorial diversity of proteins uh, that encode and regulate channel expression and localization so it's not something which is uh, a trivial problem uh, you have uh, um, each and every channel for instance the a type potassium channel is not just mediated by the the main subunits that encode it there are also several auxiliary subunits that encode it uh, so rahul chose a um, um, a computational approach first uh, so what he did was uh, he decided not to be biased by anything uh, he just took the underlying data right so he took a morphologically realistic structure uh, and he said that i will consider all the different channels that have been uh, um, uh, experimentally measured from this particular structure take exactly the kinetics and the temporal uh, uh, the kinetics and the voltage dependence of these channels uh, along the entire somatodynamic axis uh, and i'll put together a model uh, run a stochastic search and ask if uh, i can match all the five different six different functional maps in the neuron right so so he had five different ion channels uh, those are five different ion channels uh, so there were uh, six functional maps that he considered the ones that i showed you from the experimental data those were the so these were obtained by experimental from uh, actual experiments uh, uh, from uh, uh, hippocampal uh, soma and dendrites uh, these were also the same way right so so there were 11 different uh, differential equations per compartment uh, for uh, modeling these ion channels using the hodgkin axley framework uh, and the voltage uh, uh, together uh, so if you compartmentalize this morphologically realistic structure you would have around 750 to 950 compartments depending upon these parameters over here uh, and he ran a 32 parameter global sensitivity analysis uh, so he was running a, um, a, a, a blind stochastic search uh, involving this 32 parameters uh, which would span uh, density distribution kinetics and voltage dependence of these channels uh, and the passive properties like the leak channels and the capacitance uh, he would run that basically and doing this uh, 
he generated 20,420 models uh, uh, through uniform sampling of 32 parameters, uh, each of them bound uh, by what were experimentally measured. You saw those error bars, right? Uh, so these were within those error bars that were measured within uh, experimental ranges. Right, so how did he do this structuristic search? Uh, so he took this uh, 32 different models over here, right? Uh, and he had assigned the min and max bounds for this uh, based upon uh, uh, specific values that he got from uh, the corresponding recordings. Uh, he would generate one model by randomly sampling the first parameter, which is shown to be CM over here. Uh, that is the random sample of that. Uh, do the same thing for this, randomly sample this. Uh, and when he does that for all the 32 uh, parameters, uh, he would get one neuronal model, right? So he would do one neuronal model for, from uh, uh, 32 point sampling, uh, and he would build another, uh, which uh, would correspond to neuron two by another random sampling procedure, basically of uh, these 32 different model parameters. Uh, because it is a stochastic search, uh, you would find that uh, all the, um, the um, models that you generate, uh, so here he is generating n different models, uh, where n was 20,420 in this case. Uh, so all of them will not match with the, the functional map measurements uh, that we got from electrophysiology, right? So, so he has to validate that and ask which of these n models uh, uh, satisfy all these constraints that are present over here. And you will find that uh, only a small proportion of these models uh, would be valid. Uh, so if the grays are all the models, uh, the reds are the ones which will be valid models, right? In this case, uh, when he applied these experimental bounds using 18 different measurements for each of these six different functional maps, he found that only 228 of them were valid, right? Out of the 20,420, one percentage of them, around 228, were valid models, which satisfied all the functional map constraint. And therefore, within the spatial topograph, he was able to constrain all the six different functional maps so that they match with the experimental constraints, right? So he took five representative models, uh, and you see that the measurements, so this is input resistance, for instance, you see that these measurements are pretty close to each other. This is resonance frequency for five different models, and you see that they are pretty close to each other. Uh, and when he plotted the five, diff six different functional maps, uh, you see that all these five different models uh, exactly are almost similarly overlap with each other, showing that he can actually get these uh, functional maps uh, to match with each other within this modeling concept. Right? So, so here he has been um, able to achieve uh, uh, six, I mean, uh, 228 different models which had similar kind of maps uh, within the same spatial topograph. Uh, but if when he looked at the, the channels that resulted in these functional maps, uh, the underlying channels that uh, uh, gave this uh, uh, very similar functional maps over here, he found that they were all over the place. It was not like uh, they were clustered, uh, uh, giving you one cluster for sodium channels, one cluster for potassium channel, one cluster for the uh, HCN channels, and so on and so forth. Uh, he found that each of the different measurements over here spanned throughout the entire min-max range over here. And therefore, he concluded that uh, uh, individual channels uh, need not be maintained at specific conductance values uh, for functional map homeostasis, even when you had to constrain six different maps uh, on the same structural topograph over here, right? So, so that was the first conclusion that he made. Then he asked uh, if, uh, uh, if single channels are not uh, required to be maintained, uh, is there a pairwise constraint? Say, for instance, if you increase the sodium channel density, do you also have to increase the potassium channel density for you to be able to maintain this functional map homeostasis? That was the next question that he asked. Uh, to ask that, what he did was uh, he took all the 228 models uh, and performed pairwise uh, correlations between each of those uh, 32 parameters uh, and asked if the correlation coefficients with reference to them were, were higher or lower. And when he plotted that, uh, he found that all these correlation coefficients lied between, uh, uh, lay between point, minus 0.3 and plus 0.3, uh, which is very weak uh, uh, correlations. And he concluded that uh, you don't require uh, pairwise correlations uh, for you to be able to get uh, functional map homeostasis, even when you were constraining for all of them, right? So, so, so they pretty concluded the constraints on the maps imposed by morphology and by spatiokinetic interactions among ion channels uh, were insufficient to enforce uh, uh, strong correlations uh, among the parameters. And therefore, you could get very different uh, uh, combinations of channels uh, to yield exactly the same functional outcomes, right? So that was the conclusion he made. Uh, 
then within this framework of a degeneracy, this is degeneracy because you are showing that very distinct structural components, in this case ion channels, can come together to elicit exactly the same outputs or functional outputs, in this case six different functional maps. You could get exactly the same outcome with very distinct components that are yielding that particular output. Right? So, so he asked within this framework of degeneracy, can I ask which of the channels is contributing maximally to specific measurements? To do that, he called these 228 valid models as wild type models and deleted one by one each of the five channels that he had, constructed 228 virtual knockout model for T-type calcium channels and so on and so forth for each of these different channels and computed the six different maps for each of these models over here and compared them with the wild type. Right? So, so he would uh, knock out Hessian channels, get the resonance frequency, and ask how much the resonance frequency has changed with reference to the control models and so on. So forth. repeat this for each and every channel. And he constructed this, uh, this representation. There is a, I mean, the quantification in terms of histogram is there in the paper, but uh, uh, this is a, a visual representation of it. Uh, some of it is expected basically, like right? say for instance, uh, um, the resonance frequency is dependent upon HCN channel, that is something which we know, right? So, and we also know that uh, the back propagating action potential amplitude uh, will significantly change if you block the A-type potassium channel. As I mentioned already, the, B, the BAP map is dependent upon the A-type potassium channel gradient and therefore this was also known, right? So, so there were several things that in this uh, matrix, if you will, uh, was known, but there were, if you, if you focus on the A-type potassium channel over here, so this part of it was experimentally known over here, uh, that the back propagating action potential would depend upon the A-type potassium channel, and the somatic input resistance depends upon the A-type potassium channels. That was something which was known. But this part of it, in terms of what happens to the impedance profile, uh, was not known earlier, and therefore he called it as a computational prediction, and said that, uh, uh, if you if you um, um, block A-type potassium channels, then you would have significant differences to impedance properties and resistance properties. So he decided to test that experimentally, and the prediction was that uh, blocking A-type potassium channels would decrease resonance frequency but increase input resistance across the dynamic tree. So so what he did was uh, he um, calculated a bunch of baseline measurements of all the six different functional maps. Uh, and then uh, applied a blocker of uh, uh, two different blockers of uh, A-type potassium channel in two sets of experiments uh, uh, to confirm that uh, we are not making mistakes with reference to one pharmacological agent. Uh, and did the same measurements uh, all over again in the presence of uh, these blockers. Right? Uh, he performed the recordings uh, along the somatodynetic <laughs> axis uh, spanning the same 300 microns. Uh, and because he was doing it in the same neuron, he can ask, ask what exactly happened before and after in the same set of structures. So, so he observed that um, along the entire dynetic structure, irrespective of whether he was using barium chloride as the blocker or 3,4-DAP as the blocker, he saw that there was an increase uh, in the input resistance which matched with the prediction that he got from his computational model. And uh, he, uh, as a consequence of this increase in input resistance, uh, he also observed that the firing frequency uh, increased uh, as uh, uh, you blocked the A-type potassium channel, right? So this is the baseline, and here you see that there is a burst coming up. Uh, so this is a dendritic recording, and that's why you see a reduction in the action potential amplitude. Uh, and when you block the A-type potassium channel, you see that burst emanating over here again, right? So, so these are two representative examples. When you look at the population, uh, irrespective of where you are recording, at the cell body or in the dendrites, uh, you observe that there is a significant increase in the firing frequency across uh, the entire genetic structure. Finally, turning to um, the, uh, the, the resonance frequency, he showed that the prediction was that you would decrease resonance frequency if you block A-type potassium channels. Uh, and he again showed that uh, when he did the experiments and blocked them, uh, he observed that there was a decrease. Uh, uh, you notice the minus, uh, minus sign over there uh, suggesting a reduction. So there was a reduction in the resonance frequency um, irrespective of which blocker he used over here. Right? So, so, so his uh, computational predictions which came from the model, which was constrained in turn by electrophysiological measurements, uh, were confirmed by another set of electrophysiological measurements in this particular paper. Right? So, so this is, uh, um, um, I mean, one uh, story where uh, we started out with uh, electrophysiological measurements, fed that into a computational model, generated specific predictions about what the channel would do, and went 
um, um, measured those things uh, and confirmed that in uh, experiments basically right so so here in this part of uh, the the talk i showed you about uh, degeneracy in uh, hippocampal physiology where the baseline physiological measurements uh, could be obtained uh, with very different structural components uh, and you don't need to maintain specific ion channels at specific levels uh, for you to be able to get exactly the same functional outcome right so so uh, if you look at uh, plasticity which i pr which as pranay uh, mentioned uh, is the ability of the neuronal system to adapt to an external right so you have something that is coming uh, uh, from the external world and uh, you want to adapt your system to this external environment uh, and you are doing something to the system you are changing something within so that you will be able to adapt to that particular system over there right so that is what is called as plasticity and synaptic plasticity would be changes in synapses uh, that would elicit this kind of an adaptation right so so i'm going to just briefly mention these two things uh, so um, uh, this came up very recently so here uh, there are uh, uh, forms of plasticity which are very short lived uh, right so so they last only for a few hundred milliseconds or uh, a few minutes uh, and these are called a short term synaptic plasticity and they also help in uh, defining specific synaptic filters uh, uh, by changing the presynaptic mechanisms uh, and what we had uh, asked was if the presynaptic terminal expresses different ion channels and it also has different mechanisms by which it can control the uh, the calcium that is coming inside or the release that happens over here then can uh, uh, is it possible that uh, the uh, short term synaptic plasticity and synaptic filter can be achieved through different uh, combinations of these presynaptic mechanisms that was a question that we asked uh, here is one example where we showed that uh, you can get exactly the same filter so these are synaptic filters this is the frequency at which the input action potential are coming uh, and that's the short term plasticity ratio and you see that this is the synaptic filter which is defined by this short term synaptic plasticity mechanism so these filters are very similar to each other and we also uh, measured what is known as the pair pulse ratio and you see that these synaptic filters are are very similar to each other but the parameters that were underlying um, the different conductances of the different channels and all the calcium handling mechanisms uh, were very distinct uh, uh, and therefore uh, showing you that very distinct combinations of uh, of channels uh, can uh, give you the exact same functional outcome showing that you can get even um, short term synaptic plasticity profiles uh, with very different combinations over here so that is short term plasticity on the other hand with reference to long term plasticity so this is something where uh, one of those uh, uh, ideal case studies uh, where you would see the interaction between theory and experiment uh, uh, going closely and uh, this is the this is so called uh, bcm rule uh, which stands for bn and stock cooper and munro uh, it was a 1982 uh, j neuroscience paper so I write it down so that uh, so after you can also see this paper which the review which uh, How many of you are from physics background? How many of you have heard about the BCS theory of superconductivity? So the C there is Leon Cooper. The C here is also the same Leon Cooper, right? He switched over from physics to neuroscience uh, and uh, um, it's him basically. And he was the one who suggested this BCM theory, which was the theoretical basis. Uh, so that rule, the rule for how exactly synaptic plasticity should look like as a function of postsynaptic activity was suggested in 1982 before the time when uh, uh, the, the notion of homosynaptic uh, LTD or long-term depression was found in 1993 basically, right? So, so the theory came much before um, the experiments. So the experiments came much later. Uh, so here what they did was, uh, so, so by plasticity we meant that the synaptic strength has to change, right? So for changing that, what they did was uh, they gave 900 pulses of uh, uh, different uh, uh, frequencies. So you have like uh, presynaptic action potentials coming at different frequencies uh, that impinges on this particular synapse. Uh, and if you have one hertz stimulus that is coming inside, uh, the synapse would undergo depression. Right? So this is the excitatory postsynaptic potential, that's what EPSP stands for. So there is a significant reduction in the uh, synaptic strength if you go at one hertz. Uh, 
And at 10 hertz, there is nothing much happening. At, at 100 hertz and uh, even 50 hertz and 100 hertz, uh, you would see that you would get potentiation or increase in the synaptic strength, basically. Right? So, so this plasticity rule as to what exactly would be the amount of plasticity that you observe when you have different frequencies of stimulation uh, uh, was uh, found in 1993. And the BCM rule, on the other hand, uh, uh, came in 1982. And you would see that Mark Bayer was a postdoc with a postdoc or a graduate student, I'm not sure, uh, worked with uh, Leon Cooper. And uh, um, it was Mark Bayer's lab uh, which came up with this uh, um, experimental um, validation, if you will, uh, of this particular structure. And this paper tracks the, um, the, the, the evolution of this experiment from the theory and the interconnection between these uh, over this year. So, so I strongly suggest that you read this basically. Right? So, so you have this kind of a structure and one of the most important predictions of the BCM rule was that this modification threshold where you have this uh, uh, beyond this point you get potentiation and below this point you get depression is not something which is static uh, but this moves on either side. It's a sliding modification threshold. That's what they call it as. Uh, and that sliding property is something which is very important uh, in terms of giving stability to the system. Without that, you will have uh, the system undergoing either runaway excitation or dying down to zero, basically. The synapses would not have uh, learnability or adaptability after a point, right? So, so that sliding modification threshold is something which uh, uh, is an important aspect of the BCM rule. And when uh, uh, um, I mean, even though uh, everybody in the hippocampal literature agrees uh, that the, 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 the modification threshold can slide, uh, the mechanisms that mediate it has been a controversy, basically, right? So, so there have been people who have suggested that it is the, the there are receptors that could sh shift this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, sliding modification threshold. There were people who suggested that there could be enzymes uh, that could be in this and so on and so forth. Uh, um, and we notice that uh, if you have uh, um, if you have uh, different ion channels uh, on the postsynaptic structure, uh, and if you change the ion channel density, then the number of actions that you the same stimulus that is coming inside is going to change, right? So, so the response frequency, the response of the postsynaptic side is going to change if you change ion channels. So, therefore, uh, from there we showed that if you increase the HCN channel density, it's the same channel that mediated the resonance frequency map. Uh, so if you change the HCN channel density, you see that the sliding modification, the, the modification threshold actually slides, right? So, so it was initially somewhere here. Uh, and as you increase the channel density, this was a modeling paper, uh, and you see that it increases with the increase in uh, uh, channel density, right? So, so this modification threshold over here uh, can slide uh, if you change the channel density. It can move either direction, this side or that side, by just adjusting the value of this HCN channel conductance, right? So, so that was one of the things. Uh, but that was not the only channel that was capable of doing that. Uh, if you change R, which is the leak conductance associated with this channel, that also could change the, the position of this. Uh, if you change the A-type potassium channels, R and T-type calcium channels, that also could change it. It's not like there is uh, one channel that can change uh, uh, the sliding modification, the, the modification threshold, but there are several channels which can do it. Uh, uh, the, the AMPA receptors, the metapotropic glutamate receptors, uh, SK channels, uh, so the, um, the, I mean, the different receptors again. So there are so many things, uh, so many channels and receptors uh, that could give you um, uh, shifts in that particular uh, threshold over there. Uh, so, so we asked uh, if there were several ways, if the expression of the, the plasticity itself uh, expressed degeneracy, where you could have different combinations of channels and receptors uh, giving you exactly the same plasticity profile. Right? So, so here we have followed the same approach. Uh, here uh, we had nine different channels and, param uh, channels and receptors, 11 parameters, uh, 20,000 plasticity profiles, uh, and of these, uh, 360 were valid, right? So the same approach that I had outlined earlier for understanding physiology, we applied it for plasticity. Here, the number of channels and the number of parameters and the number of models that we generated are different. Uh, but it's exactly the same stochastic st search procedure without any bias uh, as to whether we are going to achieve a solution or not. Uh, so here we took like five different models which exactly had the same profile, uh, very overlapping profiles over here. Uh, and if you look at the parameters that yielded those uh, profiles over here, they're all over the place, right? So, so you can get exactly the same plasticity profile with different combinations of, uh, of ion channels. Uh, 
coming together. And here also we did not observe any pairwise correlations, um, suggesting that there is significant amount of degeneracy, not just in short-term plasticity, but also in the expression of uh, long-term plasticity profiles in these neurons. Um, so, so to summarize, uh, um, um, I mean, this is uh, uh, a modification from the most famous, one of the most famous uh, uh, quotes in biology. Uh, the original quote is, uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Uh, so because of the significant links between degeneracy and, uh, and evolution, which would come clear by uh, reading this paper, I strongly suggest again that you go through this. Uh, uh, it's very important. Uh, so I just modified it to say that nothing in physiology makes sense except in the light of degeneracy. Um, and the degeneracy ubiquitous biological property, it's a feature of complexity at uh, uh, genetic cellular systems population levels. Uh, and degeneracy the outcome of, uh, uh, and it very importantly, complexity in biological systems not be viewed from the limited of curse of dimensionality. Whenever the, the parametric space becomes larger, we always think of curse of dimensionality because uh, the solutions and the search space become intractable and making our lives miserable. It should be viewed complexity in the same uh, from the evolution stages perspective uh, of achieving functional robustness uh, through degeneracy. Right? So that's where uh, I want to leave you with, uh, except for this little video, which let's hope uh, plays. Uh, this is Richard Feynman. Uh, Feynman, Feynman. Uh. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then, then we compute. Well, don't laugh. That's what's really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guess is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature or we say compared to experiment or experience, compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make a difference how smart you are who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, wrong. That's all there is to it. Thank you. This reminds me of, of Eve Morgan does a lot of things where she's looking at, and, and Astrid Prince, and, and I guess they're all from that same group. It's, it's. Um, <laughs> So I guess she's been at Woods Hall too. I don't know. What. Yeah, yeah, we have overlapped. But, uh, yeah, she she's talked for years about you know she she had a phrase that biology isn't optimized; it's just good enough, and and how you know even with something as simple as a, stomat, a single neuron in the stomatic gastric ganglion, the the a range of of channel um, combinations so. distributions varies hugely from neuron to neuron, mm -hmm. um, but they all do exactly the same thing. So is that, that, that's essentially what you're saying, is that right? Yes, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, the only difference is that in the stomatogastric ganglion, uh, which is a system where the rhythm generation is the predominant function or pretty much the only function, um, there the goal is to maintain homeostasis uh, or robustness of that rhythm. Um, on the other hand, in the hippocampus, which is an encoding system, there are two orthogonal goal, goals as it were, two um, apparently uh, contradictory goals, where on one end you have to change for you to be able to adapt to the environment. Um, and on the other hand, you want to um, not change for maintaining homeostasis uh, so that you don't get into excitotoxic insults and things like that. Um, so the question of how um, the, the, the framework of degeneracy would fit into an encoding system is what we are trying to explore, uh, uh, which is where the, the, the complexities are much more in terms of uh, not just maintaining the robustness of the rhythms, but also in terms of uh, um, maintaining homeostasis and encoding uh, together. Um, uh, so that's the kind of questions that we are getting. If it's more specific, it's the same approach pretty much, uh, um, but from the framework of the hippocampus basically. It is, I mean, the, the, the article that I showed you would argue that it is for maintaining robustness, uh, where it is not 
uh, uh, so you have significant, if you look at adjacent hippocampal neurons, for instance, you would have a significant amount of variability in terms of the different channels that are expressed over there. Uh, and apart from that, it's not like uh, uh, you, you form a bunch of proteins and put them on the, the surface uh, and they will be there for the lifetime of uh, the neuron. Uh, it keeps uh, going through this baseline turnover, right? So, so the bunch of proteins that I started out with in my brain in the morning are not the same, of, uh, b same bunch of proteins uh, that I'm standing in front of you today, basically, right? So as of now. So, so, um, so there's a significant amount of baseline turnover and there is a significant amount of variability in terms of what exactly um, are present over there. And despite this variability, if you want to uh, maintain robustness of function, it is essential that you are capable of uh, maintaining the same functionality with disparate combinations of, uh, disparate structural combinations uh, coming together to elicit the same function, right? So, so it's a mechanism to um, maintain robustness. It's a mechanism of uh, experimentation, quote unquote, uh, in the process of evolution. Uh, so on and so forth. And invariably, it leads to this complexity. And as I keep saying to my students, it's the complexity that makes the biological system thrive, right? So we observe uh, it, it as an outsider and say that, oh, the complexity is so intractable and uh, it's impossible to analyze that system. Yes, from an analysis perspective, uh, it becomes very intractable. But in terms of the synthesis, in terms of the generation of the system that would be robust, uh, that complexity is what the biological system thrives on, right? So without that complexity, you would not have this variable combinations coming together or disparate combinations coming together to elicit the same function. And that's something which the, the paper that I mentioned earlier would argue about. There are several papers from the same group arguing about why the complexity is useful uh, for degeneracy and how it makes it uh, um, thrive within this system. So, so the complexity is uh, something which is... Can we say that degeneracy is accidental? I mean... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. What is, I mean, by the selecting the random parameters for different, different cells, what is valid models, I mean? Valid models are the ones which satisfy the, uh, the uh, experimental constraints on that particular neuron. Like say, for instance, here we had that uh, the input resistance at the soma has to fall between this particular range uh, and the resonance frequency has to fall between this range. Uh, because you are doing a stochastic sampling uh, and therefore you could be anywhere, the probability that you will get all the models to match with the experimental setup uh, is going to be zero, close to zero, I mean zero pretty much. Uh, and therefore only a very small map all the constraints that are present over there. Uh, and just because you are optimizing for one particular parameter, uh, one particular measurement, doesn't mean that you will match for other one also. Like say for instance, uh, if you match for input resistance, doesn't mean that the model is going to satisfy um, you know, resonance frequency also, because these uh, different measurements have different dependencies, which is true even experimentally. If you block one particular ion channel, um, you would see that it affects one measurement significantly and the other and that is also highly variable, right? So, so it is both differential and variable, right? So, so if you block HCN channels, for instance, uh, it would affect uh, uh, the resonance frequency significantly, but it will not affect the action potential amplitude, right? So, so, so there are these differential dependencies of channels and uh, um, measurements on channels, uh, and they are also variable. It's not like uh, in all models, uh, all the neurons, all the real neurons, uh, there will be the exact same expression of HCN channels, and therefore, if you block HCN channels, the percentage of changes that you observe uh, in the resonance frequency will be different uh, across different neurons, basically. Right? So, so therefore, it is both differential and different uh, and variable, and that is something which you observe in the real biological system when you actually do the electrophysiological measurements. Uh, therefore, you will have to do this multi-objective uh, stochastic search. It is not just multi-parametric, uh, but it is also multi-objective. You are optimizing for several different, um, several different uh, uh, objectives in terms of uh, me measurement A, measurement B, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you are trying to match as much close as possible to the experimental value and asking if these different constraints together are matched in the presence of significant variability or do you require very specific values for the different conductances. Uh, and it has been clear uh, uh, for several years now that uh, degeneracy is something which is ubiquitous uh, across several biological systems and neurons are no exception to that. Showed us, uh, so I wanted to know like uh, this degeneracy 
and the multiple cases you showed, is there a bound between that? So, in the, so there could be a min max. Mm -hmm. The variations you, you see, is there a window where it fits? And does the window size vary in multiple cases you see? Is that a way to quantify degeneracy? So um, in the cases that we had, uh, we observed that we had that min max. Yes. And if you observe the histograms over here, um, you will see that they are all over the place. Um, there is no, right? uh, if you see here, these are the histograms corresponding to each of those different models over there. And uh, the left is min and the right is max. Uh, so let's say, for instance, this is the, the Hetzian conductance, uh, right? Uh, and you see that this is still a, the, this is the min and that's the max. Uh, and you see that all the, the valid models uh, are spanning pretty much the entire range. Uh, they are not like, uh, so there are some of them, like this is the activation, uh, uh, half maximal activation voltage of sodium channels. Uh, there you see that there is some kind of a clustering, uh, and there too there is a significant uh, uh, variability over there also, right? But uh, most of the models are within that central range of it. Uh, but for most of the parameters, uh, you observe that uh, they pretty much span the entire case. There is not uh, clustering over there, right? Uh, so, so it is like it's like um, in this case, it turns out that uh, if you change one parameter, there are several other parameters which compensate for that one change, uh, thereby yielding same functional outcome, right? So, so the amount of variance that you observe in the functional end of it, uh, so minimal compared to what you see in the underlying. Uh, uh, so it's as if the function is emergent uh, from these underlying uh, components over here, where different components can come together to elicit the same function with without much variance at the in the functional space, basically, right? Uh, Any other questions? Uh. Yeah, so um, you looked at the CA1 uh, hippocampal neurons, right? Uh, is there any way that if you change the morphology of the cell or the cell type, the neuronal cell type, you will see a variation in the degeneracy? It, it also contributes to the degeneracy. Uh, you would see that there is significant amount of variability in the morphology also. And if you change the morphology, if you cut down the dendritic structure, for instance, if you uh, suggest, I mean, if you impose atrophy on it, uh, where you are cutting down it, I mean, a reduction in dendritic uh, um, uh, structure would be called as atrophy, and if it is increasing, it would be called as hypertrophy. Right? So, so if you sub subject the um, the dendritic models to hype, uh, atrophy. You would see that because the surface area is reducing, in general, you would have an increase in excitability, right? So because excitability, if you calculate input resistance for a simple uh, uh, isopotential compartment, uh, you would see that it is uh, uh, inversely related to the surface area. And therefore, you would see that uh, the, the input resistance would increase uh, if you cut down the dendritic structure. And therefore, uh, that is an additional variable. And even with the same density of different channels, uh, you would see that you would get uh, um, a different number of ion channels because of the difference in surface area and things like that. Uh, so that also contribute to it. Uh, and what happens is, uh, as you cut down the dendritic structure to much more smaller structures, uh, if you maintain the same kind of passive properties, uh, it would become very electronically compact, uh, which is to say that the amount of attenuation from one end of the neuron to the other end of the neuron will not be that much. Uh, and on top of it, if you have these gradients, uh, that doesn't make any difference because uh, so we had a paper on that. Uh, so there was a paper. Um, you can look at my website. So we had a paper on uh, what exactly the dendritic atrophy would do for uh, the different functional maps, uh, and we showed that if same channel gradients uh, with a very atrophied neuron, you would see that it will become very flat. The, the functional map doesn't express. Uh, it will become very flat basically, uh, and therefore yes, the morphology is also. An uh, a parameter. Uh, the functional maps won't emerge uh, if it were an electronically compact uh, neuron. You would want an electronically non-compact neuron um, if you want these functional maps to emerge. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't make sense to have a higher density at one end uh, at low end and lower density at the other, because if the whole compartment is isopotential, right, uh, then it is as though the whole voltage is going to be exactly the same, and therefore the whole neuron is going to act the same. Therefore, it doesn't make sense uh, to have uh, uh, these channel gradients uh, in neurons which are, isopoten uh, which are isopotential. Only when you have neurons which are electronically non-compact uh, 
would these channel gradients make any sense uh, in terms of maintaining this differential processing, right? So, so yeah, morphology is also an important parameter and that would contribute, the morphological parameters also would contribute to degeneracy where you have different structural components where morphological parameters also add to that uh, uh, would lead to very diff very similar functional outcomes. Like say for instance, you could have uh, uh, a smaller dendritic tree and you can have like a pretty high uh, expression of uh, HCN channels or something like that. Uh, so here this would increase the excitability and the increase in HCN channels would decrease it, uh, thereby giving you the same input resistance with reference to another morphology which is larger with a lower density of HCN channel, right? So, so you can think of all the possible um, 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 parameters uh, and you can think of how different combinations of them could elicit the same function. So as the number of parameter goes up, uh, you would see that uh, uh, the degeneracy would uh, basically express in a much more higher degree. Right. You have a question? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I may not be technically correct. So, so there are these uh, many parameters and giving it a, uh, output. So, can I say that these are uh, uh, equations are interrelated in such a way, coupled in such a way that uh, the output is coming same. That's why you're having this kind of degeneracy. One is increasing, another rising kind of thing. So, the the nonlinear coupling that is present over here is staggering, uh, in the sense that you have these different ion channels. Uh, each of them have their activation inactivating curve, inactivation curves, which are um, nonlinearly dependent upon voltage. Uh, and then there are uh, the spatial uh, dynamics associated with, there are different densities of uh, channels which are present at one end of it, different densities of channel present at the other end. Uh, and they are coupled through space and voltage, right? So the voltage is propagating uh, and they are coupled through voltage as well, right? So, so the kind of coupling that you observe in this system is so much. Uh, that I mean to analytically track this uh, this kind of a complexity becomes uh, I mean impossible, right? So so you have so many different ion channels, each one having uh, its own nonlinear dynamics associated with it, uh, and not just that the kinetics are coupled to each other. One uh, channel A affects voltage, uh, and that voltage affects channel B, and the opening of that channel would affect the voltage, and so forth. Uh, so you have this complicated relationship, not just along time but along space as well. Um, and therefore, it becomes very difficult to uh, see if they are uh, analytically tracked down the kind of coupling that they have. Uh, and that's the reason you use an empirical approach where you constrain as much as possible each of these uh, differential equations that are present over there, uh, distribute them with the specific parameters, with specific densities, with specific kinetics over there, and allow them to interact uh, and ask questions about what kind of uh, physiological outcomes that you observe and how they are related to the the uh, the measurements, uh, so, I mean, yes, uh, but it's impossible to track it. Down. Right. So let's thank uh, Ricky again. For